Hello, world. This is Chandra Ford. I am the director of the Center for the Study of Racism, Social Justice, and Health at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. And I am ex officio co-chair of our center's COVID Task Force on Racism and Equity. And I am having a conversation this morning with James Huynh, who is a doctoral student in our, in our school, and Dr. Bita Amani, who chairs the COVID Task Force and is an associate professor at the Charles R. Drew University of Science and Medicine. So thank you both for joining me. Would, is there more that you would add to your introduction you think folks should know? Okay. Well, last week we posted a blog. And James, could you remind us where the blog is located? Yeah, of course. So the blog is on the center's website at racialhealthequity.org. You can also find it on Medium, uh, which we just launched our COVID task force Medium account. So we have two blog posts, um, Dr. Amani's, which is titled The Collisions Between uh, COVID-19 and Structural Racism. And then we also have another one from a community partner, Emilio, who's part of the Youth Justice Coalition in Los Angeles. Excellent. So I want to talk today, I want to reflect on the blog post that you, Vita, did, um, the, the interview in the blog post that you did with Nina Sharif, who's a postdoctoral scholar here at the center. Could you just talk a little bit about what prompted you to write this? To participate in that interview? Well, you know, the, um, the impetus behind it was to want to be able to articulate what were the thoughts and emotions that we had around convening in March. I mean, if we can like take a moment to breathe and think back to, you know, middle of March, uh, there's no toilet paper right <laughs> anywhere. Um, we are all deeply concerned about um, one, the, the pit, what we're growingly recognizing as something that we don't know much about, but we do know that we need to get our systems in order so that we can learn more about it. And two, we were concerned that what is happening, um, how, is, how is the United States um, and more broadly the rest of the world gonna be able to handle having a virus which we don't know much about um, and all of our you know, pre-exercises and scenarios that we've done prior to this moment have said, the best way to get out of this is to make sure that everybody has what they need. And so we know that that's not the case. We know that structural racism exists. We know that there's already these persisting health inequities. Um, and so we were really concerned as to like, what is that gonna look like? We know we don't have toilet paper, but what else is coming? And so you know, with that kind of um, urgency, um, back in March, we got together. And so the reason behind putting this blog um, was to be able to articulate that and to get that, um, get that original feeling out to the rest of the world so that folks can kind of understand where we're coming from and why we've um, held this energy since then. That really also reflects your training in epidemiology and infectious disease epidemiology, as well as structural racism. James, um, I'm wondering about a student perspective on this. What prompted you to be concerned? Because you've been involved with this task force from the very beginning. Right. I think as a student back in March, um, it was uh, UCLA was hitting winter quarter finals. And then right before finals week was when the school decided, OK, we are going to shelter in place. Everything will be remote. And so it was really sudden um, and I think sent a lot of people into panic. Um, but looking back at it now in it's September, almost October, um, I think that was a wise decision considering the growing number of cases and how the US from March to now has jumped to a country, a country with one of the highest like, cases and deaths. Um, but I think even more than that, um, I was really concerned about the pandemic or COVID specifically back in December, January, when people were saying, this is a disease coming out of China. 
and my initial concern was people are going to scapegoat Chinese and other people racialized as Asian, like this is going to follow a history of um, yellow peril and thinking of non-white bodies as inherently diseased. Um, and that has only been confirmed with um, the 45th administration's Kung flu virus statements or Chinese virus. Um, and so everything that Dr. Amani posed in the blog post about the role of racism um, in exacerbating the effect of COVID-19 is so, I think, spot on. And um, in many ways, even though COVID has sent us into a panic, that panic, I think, um, is not surprising in how it's been playing out with the communities that we care so much about. That's a really interesting question. I wish, could you both speak to that more? I mean, I'm really struck by how many people there are now out there in the public who are making comments about racism or about the pandemic and so forth, who may or may not have real training in these areas but I know that both of you draw on a substantial amount of investment in studying history and the combination with critical race theory and other racializing uh, theories and public health. So could you talk about how you draw on, uh, you know, research, scholarship, theory, et cetera, to inform your understanding about where we are today and why it's not so surprising to you. Um, so I mean, I think that's such a perfect question and I wish I had this image. Um, so I just recently got on Twitter. So I'm so excited to go through and to see um, all this, you know, kind of brilliance and, um, you know, all these resources um, that our folks have been pulling together. And there's this image that I saw recently of like, um, it's, it's supposed to be, you know, it's this huge iceberg, which is like very expansive underneath the water. And then the tip of it um, is, you know, technically all you can see. And the top is, you know, it's supposed to indicate like, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about racism, like in terms of the broader discourse. And I think that's, um, you know, kind of what you're, um, what you're getting at Dr. Ford in your question. And then underneath is that entire civilizational foundation, right? That's centuries old in the making that from the mo first moment it's been here, people have been pointing at it, being like, look under the water, something is being built. Something is so huge, it's so expansive. It is in our ideas. Um, it is trying to talk about our genetics to get us away from talking about our structures. Um, and so when you're um, in this question that you're asking, all I can help but think about is all the work that's been done across so many different disciplines to not only talk about the ideas of racial logics and racial thinking, um, but to get us to understand how race um, as a concept, right, being the child of racism, um, that race um, as an idea. And I, you know, I always go back to, you know, Dorothy Roberts's articulation of it right as like a political invention um, that race as a political invention um, shape shifts it's dynamic it also it, it's not static so when Jane was was talking about the yellow peril and you know what the feelings were back in um, December I was thinking about MERS and all the you know anti-muslim racism that had come out then around you know you know this is a disease that was in camels, now it's in humans. Hmm, I wonder how it got there, right? It's very like eerily, very similar to the conversation on, you know, bats that we were having at this time. How do people eat? How do people do this? All the ways that even right now when talking about racism will do anything but want to get at the penetrating roots that have been here for a very long time. All the ways that we will distract each other from actually um, talking about systems of power. Um, that's, you know, the scholarship that and the discourse and the activism and organizing that pulls us into the structure and the roots, you know, that's the stuff that we've been studying for, you know, um, over a decade. And that's the, the energy that we're bringing into the task force. That's outstanding and exciting. James, what would you say? 
I was really struck when Dr. Armani said that um, race is the child of racism. Um, I think that's such a crucial point because and I remember Dr. Ford, you had posed that question in your critical race theory class too. Um, like, what's the causal order here? Um, and I think it's so important to think of race as the child of racism because really racism is that which structures so much of our society, if not all of it. Um, and I think so often people say, oh, race plays a factor in this health outcome, um, it's a risk factor for this. And I think when we do that, we fall on the logic of, you know, biological essentialism, like, because you are this X race, therefore you have Y outcomes. Um, and we're seeing that with, this might be a whole nother conversation, but with the vaccine trials, it's like, we need to enroll more people of this race because that's the community that's being affected. but is that following like that logic of like certain people of a race have, you know, um, some kind of inherent biological trait. And we know from critical race theory and um, the racism literature that it's really social, political and economic factors and conditions um, that are structuring people's health. And so, yeah, I, I thought that was such a brilliant way to just encapsulate all of that. Um, I do want to share that um, Ta-Nehisi Coates has a, a, a fantastic um, um, quote in which he articulates that um, race is the child and racism is the father. Um, and so, and then, you know, and right, and because you picked up on that, James, um, some of the other fantastic um, kind of the ideas that he um, couples with that are to remind us about racism being a system of governance, um, you know, in, in its own way, um, which I think all this, the scholarship that we're um, discussing, you know, throughout the task force, wanting to make sure to keep this stuff grounded um, in this like intellectual legacy, right? That we are um, really taking to task to bring into this moment and add to it all the current and fantastic scholarship that's being generated um, you know, it, when we think about racism as a system of governance, then we also clearly um, can then see that the demands that are being made from the community in terms of just like deep transformation are essentially all political questions. And so for us to get caught up in any sort of biological, medical, cultural connections and thinking through of like racism, any sort of determinism in that way really detracts us from having that kind of transformative change. Um, so yeah, I, I completely agree with you that when you can just see the relationships between them, then it also reorients you to where you need to go and who, and who you should be listening to in this moment. Yeah, the who. That's the... <laughs> oh, go ahead, please. Go ahead. <laughs> No, go ahead. Um, for, I think for the WHO, I think so much of what we've been dis discussing so far has been the important scholarship out there. Um, but I think to pair with that scholarship is the history of activism and organizing as well. Uh, and not that the two are mutually exclusive. Um, I think they're very much intertwined. Um, and I, you know, I really came into like anti-racism work really through organizing first, um, and then later academia. And so I think it's so important in this moment, and that's why we have the COVID storytelling project to really center the narratives of the people who are literally on the ground, um, working every day to change their local conditions. Um, I think it's one thing for scholarship to be, to be able to articulate our different systems of power that we're contending with, um, but then another for grassroots organizers to be literally, um, you know, doing that everyday work of contending with politicians, um, mobilizing base building, like building those relationships with the community um, and activating and harnessing their power. Um, 
So that's why I'm, I'm so excited about all the different focus groups that we've been doing in the storytelling project. I'm so glad you brought that up. So the COVID storytelling project is um, a real, um, it's really the big focus of this, of our task force right now. So Dr. Amani, what is the COVID storytelling project and, and what would you say to people out there about getting involved with it? So the, the COVID storytelling project was um, our you know, initial task force desire to be able to document and strategically push out um, and possibly get to places community demands um, right now during the pandemic. You know, we are public health you know, um, professionals, public health scholars, and, and because we take the issue of social justice um, you know, we, we center that in our work, we then also center community health, right? Um, because we recognize that in all the ways that we've been discussing that the system does not provide the material needs um, to communities and then also structures and the needs it does provide in these disparate ways, right? Um, that folks have still been managing and not only managing but thriving and the ways that they've been doing that is by organizing and creating their own systems. So then one of the dangers here at, you know, at the time of the pandemic is that can these systems um, get what they need in order to be able to provide for folks so that we can you know, get out of here with everybody um, versus just you know, like, we're, you know, like we're continuously um, just you know, seeing right now um, with some people being hit more than others. And so when we think about that, then if we think about this as a community health oriented project, a social justice oriented project, it really is a matter of documenting how communities already organized, how they're organized in a way that's systematic, how they've been doing this work prior to the pandemic, how their work is essential during the pandemic, and how their own brilliance that's emerging at this time as to where the system is still missing, um, not, like not getting it, right? These are the things that we need to elevate. And then also it's a solidarity project um, in the sense that COVID storytelling is supposed to help us be able to see that across these demands, there are things that are common and not in, you know, not in our more like kind of soft multicultural, not, you know, in the soft multicultural sense of like, oh, we're all you know, we all share things in common, you know that in our struggle of organizing, we have demands that are common demands. Um, and so these are the these are the parts that we hope to kind of bring together um, through COVID storytelling, and then to be strategic about where we want the information and the demands to go. That's exciting. That's so exciting. Well, I think we are at our time limit. So I want to thank you both. Um, if you are interested in learning more about the Center for the Study of Racism, Social Justice, and Health at UCLA and at Charles R. Drew University, go to racialhealthequity.org. That's racialhealthequity.org. And you can find information there about our task force, the COVID Racism Task Force, the COVID Task Force on Racism and Equity, excuse me. Um, and you can find our blog there by Dr. Romani. Um, anything else that you two would add? Um, if you'd like to learn more about the COVID Storytelling Project, uh, please follow us on Twitter at COVID Racism. Uh, we're also on Facebook and Instagram, but check out Twitter first. <laughs> <laughs> at COVID Racism. Dr. Romani? You know, I, I just you know, want to say that we, um, you know, in the spirit that Dr. Ford had when um, she was like, let's do this um, and, let's, um, and let's do this for a long time, right? Um, because we got that this is not gonna be, um, this is not a moment um, only, but that this is, you know, part of that continuation of history. Um, our fantastic community collaborators, um, you know, when you come, you know, follow the links and all the, the handles that, um, that were just given, um, connect to our com community collaborators, um, and then also know that we're, we're trying to be a resource here. Um, so we welcome all the conversations and all the feedback. Okay. Well, I thank you both. It's a 
privilege and a pleasure to be involved with you. And I actually, I do, do want to close by acknowledging that we all do our work here in Southern California on lands originally inhabited by the Gabrielino Tongva peoples, who are still here, but displaced by our land grant institution. And we make this acknowledgement, even though we are fighting against racism, because even those of us who have legitimate claims about um, racism, imperialism by our US government, nevertheless are complicit with and benefit from the forms of oppression that have been visited upon the indigenous peoples of the Americas. It's also a reminder in the COVID era that the inequities we see today among uh, Native Americans, Alaska Natives, and, and other um, indigenous populations cannot be viewed disconnected from the historical insults and assaults that these communities have experienced. Thank you for joining us. We hope that you'll join us again um, on our next videos and um, our next events and online and social media. Bye-bye.